I'm Caleb with You Can Make This Too. If you had my tools, today we're going to start working on a coffee bar for the new house. It's been way too long since I've done a project for us. And uh, yeah, it's time, time to do that to make sure I still have a new house to live in. Took three trips yesterday, but I was able to find a sheet of melamine to build the form for the doors because they're gonna have epoxy river in it. I'm just trying to decide if I wanna start with working on this or start with the steel for the frame. Um, you'll find out in a second. I'm gonna go sit down for like 15 minutes and decide. Okay, so we got the pieces coming together to be the form. The trick is a slab that we'll be doing that we'll be cutting the sides and all the door faces out of is longer than eight feet. So got to make this longer. Fortunately, I didn't have to take two big swipes out of that sheet. Uh, just cutting the other way gave me enough length, more than enough. So I could also cut the little end caps. We're not going to do a full mold. We're only going to mold out the river. You'll see what I mean when when we do that. The problem though is I like using melamine because it's three quarter and it's fairly rigid, but once you get to these kind of lengths, it's just not rigid enough and no one likes a big long floppy member. It's just not gonna give us a good slab in the end. So we need to add some more rigidity to it. The way we're gonna do that is some of these offcuts we used as support, we'll use that to join these two pieces, strengthen it all up. But, uh, and then since I have these two mobile tables, we'll turn them long ways so that way we have full support and they're height adjustable so we can get everything dialed in and, and uh, level now to do it. This is the piece that's going to become the doors, because I'm out of practice on recording, we started working with that recording. So we gotta get all the bark off, uh, used a chisel and hammer some, now we're switching to the draw knife to get down to the cambium layer, cambium, whatever, and then we're gonna use a wire wheel to take it down to the wood, and then we'll, you know, cut this, get it on the mold, finish mold it up, do the fun epoxy pour. Also take the thickness down some, because it's pretty thick, so. That's what we're doing now. So we've got it all molded up and ready to go. Uh, melamine, bottom melamine on the ends. We also made sure we caulked these pieces on the bottom when we screwed them down. And then you saw me lay the tape on the bottom side of the walnut and caulk that. The reason for that is caulk tends to really get in wood and it's hard to get out. But I've learned if I tape it first and then put the caulk over the tape, you just lift the tape. It's kind of like the CA glue and blue tape trick. Same thing, and this has been waxed really well dusted and dusted and dusted, so it's time to mix up some epoxy. I'm gonna use Total Boat Thick Set for this, which uh, max pour is about half an inch. Um, I've calculated that this is about four and three quarters of a gallon, so we'll go just a touch high, mix about two and a half gallons or something, something that's easy to do with the ratios, and pour the first layer, and then it's already afternoon, so tomorrow I should be able to pour the second layer, bring it up to the surface.
So first coat has had a few days to dry because I didn't pour immediately after and it fully cured. Uh, came back and lightly sanded it with 320 and just dusted it off really good. About to do the next pour and I got a big bucket so I don't have to do the split bucket thing. Um, we have, as you saw, this is pretty, not opaque, a very solid color. Next we're gonna go almost exclusively, if not exclusively, mica pigment so I can get all the cool swirly effects because this is the top, but we have a solid red background for it. So I've been playing with kind of layering, um, layering the layers to see how that does with the layers and the layers. So yeah, let's uh, mix up and basically do the uh, same thing we just did, except it'll look marginally different. So common misunderstanding about deep pore epoxies and all the effects that happen with the mica pigment is that you gotta swirl all that stuff in there. It's actually a churning, well, and you can if you hit it at the right point, and it is really fun to do, and I kind of played with it some, but all that went away within a minute or two. What you're seeing right now is the epoxy starting to go exothermic a little bit, not in the runaway reaction, but just the reaction that's supposed to happen. And it churns itself. And because that pigment flows pretty freely, we get all these cool effects. So we'll keep watching and try to catch one just as it starts. So you can see it go from nothing to something all on its own. And as this continues to warm up, we'll see it happening more and more. We didn't quite catch this one right away, but this is the one I was talking beside. And then this one just popped up on its own. You can see all the new little cells kind of forming in it. So while the rest of the river is drying, we're gonna switch over and start welding up the base. Off camera, we cleaned all this up because it's been beside the shop and really rusty. And Robbie got it all cut down for me. So time to start welding it up. Um, hope you don't mind missing the cutting. Basically, it's uh, the most annoying sound on earth for a really long time. What's that sound like, Robbie? <coughs> That's it. <laughs> So this is the front or back. We have both sides and all three runners. Now we need to put the dividers in. I cut some scrap pieces of maple to the right size and we have this one set and we roughly set this one. So what we're gonna do is weld this. I guess I could have cut more, but then we'll weld this, move these pieces and we'll use the wood to make sure everything's in its right place. Always use, you know, blocking when you can than just trying to trust measurements. Cause it might not be a big deal if, and you probably wouldn't even notice if all these were off, say an eighth of an inch, where that would turn into a real pain though. If all these are off a little bit, you know, every single door has to be individually cut. But if I make sure everything's consistent, then I can just cut all those doors same size and then just finesse a little bit. Yeah, whatever. You get it, I'm a weld.
So the pour is cured and looking really good. Um, ended up having to do another one. I could have caulked this, but I really hate digging caulk out of wood, so I just let it go over. Um, so now demold this and run it through the planer, which always makes me a little nervous. The alternative is I could go ahead and cut this into sections and then put on a CNC, use the CNC to flatten it, bring everything to thickness. But that introduces a few more problems to try to solve. So we're just going to do some light passes on the planer and bring it into uh, where it's ready to sand and go from there. At a point, it's time to start making the drawer boxes. Off camera, I milled up a bunch of poplar I had down to half inch thickness, pretty typical for drawer construction. And finally gonna work out the sliding table on my new table saw for the first time. First time I really do much work. Gonna use this to cross cut everything down to length using the, the stops, all the four pieces, and then going to dovetail these together using the workstation on the Shaper Origin. Also the first time, normally I just do dovetails by hand, but I'm doing four drawer boxes. That'll add up to a bunch, take a lot of time. So I'm gonna try to do that, which is pretty similar to just using a dovetail template with a router, except it happens digitally instead of mechanically, and I've gotta build the program for that. But yeah, time to break these down, get a groove set in them for the drawer bottoms and start dovetailing these things out. Got the shaper all dialed in, did a few test cuts, and it's working well. For If you're not familiar, this is a handheld CNC that uses this domino tape and a camera to know where it is and then follow the design. So you manually move it, and it has some servos that then makes the spindle float to make sure it's cutting exactly where it's supposed to. And if you get too far outside parameters, it jerks the spindle up so you don't botch your piece. Um, I have this because it's really handy if you have really big things. I do a lot of tables that wouldn't fit on my Penguin CNC. I can use this to do like inlays up to any scale. I could do a whole floor with this. But they have this workstation, which is permanent, so you can fixture pieces for repeatability. Could also use my Penguin, but I'm not set. I don't have anything set up to mount pieces vertically on the front of it like this is set up for. But yeah, anyway, let me show you. Basically, got the adjustable rest move it up front and now it's a surface to make sure that these go all the way up. I've got a little edge guide here so then I can clamp my stock repeatably against one side and against the top. And once it's set, I can move my rest back down, make sure I have plenty of room for the bit clearance, load up the file and cut, then I'll just flip it I do the same thing for the pin boards and the tail boards. I just change which file I'm running in the machine. And uh, that's pretty much it. Like I said, it's very much like just a manual jig, except it's doing it digitally instead of mechanically. So got all the pieces cut, add a few extras. So one of the, the worst boards that I didn't want to get to, fortunately didn't make any errors, so I didn't have to use them. But gonna do a little 
test fit here. Of course, I did a test before I ran all of them and that came together, but need to get all my measurements and such to start cutting the drawer bottoms. I could have done the groove for the bottom before doing all the joints, but I prefer to have it together just because uh, a little more precision that way in case, you know, things aren't perfect. And also I want to make sure that the grooves fall on a tail so they won't be seen from the side. And I can just do full passes at the table saw and don't have to rat it out or anything. But yeah, this looks good. Just the tiniest bit proud so that'll sand out nice. Woo. All right. So yeah, time to uh, take some measurements, cut down some quarter inch plywood to be the bottoms and then start running all these on the table saw to get a groove. And then they'll pretty much be ready to, uh, to glue up, which I'm not entirely positive that everything is perfectly, perfectly square. So since these are, are dovetailed, um, let me see, I can pull it apart this direction but they will not pull apart in this direction because the dovetail holds it, which is the way I designed it because this would be the front. So these drawers can't come apart, especially once they're wedged in there. And I'm tempted to not glue them. So that way, once I get them in there, if they need a little bit of flex, they can just kind of friction fit in there with the drawer slides. Haven't decided yet. Anyway, next steps. Dumped my footage and found out some of the files got corrupted from after that uh, last clip you saw. So anyways, I got these end pieces screwed in and all of the slides installed, sanded all my pieces down here, and then I actually polished the epoxy for the first time. So I sanded up to a thousand grit with my Merca Abernet and then used the Total Buff and Total Shine from Total Boat with my buffer to polish these and I'm really impressed with that. It really didn't take very long now that I have a buffer. So I think whenever I do epoxy stuff like big epoxy, definitely gonna be doing that from now on. And also got all the drawer boxes put together. I think that footage did survive and sanded everything. So these are ready for finish. And also what I decided to do was instead of gluing all these, I wanted the drawers to be able to wiggle a little bit to deal with any issues and building the frame. So what I did was just shot a few brad nails through the dovetails because when you pull on the drawer this way, the way they go, the dovetail shape holds everything together, but there's a side to side issue. Now, when they're in the case, of course, they're going to get pinched between the slides that holds them together. But if we ever take the drawers out of the case, there might be an issue with like the sides getting pulled apart somehow, but a couple brad nails fix that. So anyway, what I have left before I can start putting finish on is this board is going to be my drawer fronts. I need to cut this up to the drawer fronts and then that plywood is going to be the bottom. So I just need to get those pieces cut out and then we can get to the finishing sequence and, and everything kind of comes together. everything cut and you might not might have noticed one of my uh, drawer faces had this giant knot so I just taped the living daylights out of it and we're gonna do a little pour on this use some thick set and 
yeah, and then keep moving along and be ready to add some finish. Of course, the only thing uh, I haven't done the top yet, but I need a little bit more room in the shop before I can get to that. So I'm do a little pour, start doing some finish. Uh, might see if I can drag that thing in here and just finish all at once. Haven't decided yet. So I hauled the top in here. This is a 24 inch wide, like two inch thick, eight feet long slab of walnut. It's heavy as heck. Um, it's actually very flat. The problem is um, it has some nice figure, which I love to be the top, but because of that figure and the grain inconsistencies, it is a little ripply. Um, and I do want this fairly flat so stuff's not rolling around on it. My planer, because of the figure, is just gonna cause massive tear out. I learned that on I've just, I've learned it, so I'm pricing out helical heads. That's gonna hurt, but uh, it'll be worth it, I think. So, to get this flat in the meantime, I'm going to put it on my Penguin CNC, and we'll, we'll tile it and flatten it on a few, in a few passes on there, and then we'll get to finishing, because no reason to uh, have to set up the spray system more times than I need to. Okay, first pass complete. Give you guys a look at the top so you can see how we have flat sections and then some places we didn't quite hit that were a little lower. Initially, <coughs> I plan to do two passes in each run. Each pass is about 0.1 inches, so I set it to do 0.2 total. But after I did that first 0.1 inch pass, I decided, since I'm basically skip planing this, I didn't build a sled or anything, it's just referencing off the other side, which I know isn't flat, what I'm gonna do was I did 1.1 inch pass. I'm gonna flip it over, do the same thing on the other side. Now that this is pretty flat, and then the other side will be even flatter, then I'll flip it over and do another pass, flip it, do one more pass. So each side is gonna get 2.1 inch passes, but I'm only gonna do one pass at a time, so there'll be a bunch of flips. Anyway, hope that makes sense. My just fear was I'd take off almost a quarter inch slide it down, move it, and then everything wouldn't line up in a plane. So I'd have like one section flat like this, one section flat like this, and then the third section flat like that. Not all in the same plane. Fortunately, that didn't happen. Everything came out really close. I do have just a slight unevenness, so probably could have ran ahead, but better safe than sorry. Time to flip this, do it, and then flip it and do it two more times. All the components are done and finished and everything. You saw me wipe on the armor seal, use general finishers armor seal. Then off camera, I came back and sprayed conversion varnish. Generally don't record spraying much because I don't like getting over spray all over my expensive camera. So anyway, um, everything is about to come together. I made a little jig or two jigs precisely that you'll see how they work to uh, line up the holes for the hinges that I'm gonna screw into this. Um, I was concerned a little bit because the hinges are gonna get screwed into end grain. So I'm swapping out the screws that came with the hinges for some much longer screws to offset that. And I'm not concerned just because it's just doors and not structural components. So I don't think it's gonna be a big deal. So yeah, every, you're just about to see us screw in the bottoms, get the hinges all set and get the doors set, drawer fronts screwed on, covered, how to do all these individual steps in a lot of my videos before. And I think after we screw on the hinges, I'm probably going to TIG weld them onto the frame, um, just a little more precise that way. And my, what I was considering before is drilling holes, tapping and bolting. That'd take forever. I think it might be easier to just clamp them in place, get out the TIG torch, uh, might not even use any filler, just, just fuse them together and do that. So uh, yeah, here we go.
So of course, that wasn't the only project for the dining room makeover. There were three projects, the coffee bar, dining table, and the chairs. So if you enjoyed this project, make sure you check out the other ones. If they're not out, they will be out so shortly. I'm gonna release them all three weeks in a row. Yeah, this is it. I hope you learned something, were inspired, or at least entertained. Until next time, make time to make something. <laughs> you know not to record me looking like an idiot, right? You know how pissed some people are going to be that it's crooked? Basically, it's uh, the most annoying sound on earth for a really long time. What's that sound like, Robbie? <coughs> That's it. <coughs> That's it. <coughs>